So I would say we, I see Marie uh, ready to start with the first paper. And indeed the first paper is uh, on non-banks and uh, possible access to the LOLR, which I had uh, highlighted as one of the uh, key uh, um, research and policy questions on the table. So Marie, the floor is yours. You have 30 minutes. Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Let me share my screen. Thank you very much for putting our paper on the program. It's really great pleasure to be a part of Money Market Conference, our flagship events on Money Market. Um, we are going to talk about non-banks and the access to the NFS resort, and we're going to look in particular on what happened to the investment fund sector during the March 2020 liquidity crisis. This is joint work with uh, my colleague from the ECB, Johannes Breckenfelder, and former ECB colleague, Nicholas Grimm. And I should say that the views expressed are solely our own and do not necessarily represent the views of the ECB or the Eurosystem. I think it's needless to argue in this uh, audience that non-banks are becoming increasingly important uh, in the financial system. In the Euro area, their assets doubled over the last decade. And they also became a significant source of funding for non-financial corporations, constituting about 20% of total credit. As the importance of non-banks grew, so did concerns that the buildup of risk in non-banks can adversely affect financial stability and monetary policy transmission. And I think it's fair to say what happened in March 2020 um, gave some support to these concerns whereby we witnessed an unprecedented liquidity crisis in the investment fund sector. There were large redemptions or heightened redemption risks, margin calls, hidden investment funds, and all that put liquidity strains on this sector. As investment funds faced the liquidity crisis, the obvious question came up, do they need access to the land of last resort? For example, do funds need access to central bank liquidity facilities? or should their shares be eligible for central bank asset purchases? So with this work today, we want to provide an input into these discussions. We will definitely not provide an, a, a full answer, but we will provide hopefully an input to think about the cost benefit analysis of uh, this question of whether non-banks should have access to the land of last resort. Let me start by showing you one aspect of this liquidity crisis of March 2020, and here we are zooming in on the runs experienced by the euro area mutual funds. The chart here illustrates aggregate net fund flows uh, in percent of uh, total net assets um, between January 2020 and June 2020. So when you see the positive bars, it means that inflows in the uh, in this in these mutual funds, we're looking here at investment grade investment funds, um, are higher than the outflows. And when you see large negative bars, it means that outflows outweigh the inflows. So what you see is at the beginning of March, there has started this uh, large outflows of funds in the mutual funds um, of investment grade. And these uh, outflows reached the peak about mid-March, um, with outflows being about minus 0.5% of TNA. And then the outflows slowly diminished, and basically there were no more outflows by the end of March. With the vertical bars here, we illustrate some of the events. So there was the onset of this liquidity crisis at the beginning of March. Then the middle vertical bar here illustrates the uh, announcement of the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program that was announced on March 18. And the last vertical bar uh, signifies the start of purchases under the PEP on March 26, 2020. These are some of the events we will explore in our analysis, uh, but you see how they line up nicely to some of the developments in these net flows of uh, in euro area mutual fund sector. Now, these outflows were in March 2020 were by no means confined to the euro area. In fact, exceptionally large outflows were also documented for uh, US bond mutual funds, for example, in the work by Falato et al. And as mutual funds faced outflows, they needed to get liquidity, so they sold assets. Uh, and this indeed put strains on broader financial markets, as has been documented uh, by a couple of recent papers, including a very nice paper by, uh, by our discussing human market. 
So this is sort of to give you an idea of the run phenomenon that uh, mutual funds experienced in March 2020. What we also document is that funds faced a dry up in the repo markets, and this is a chart to illustrate um, this dry up. It shows you new bank lending to funds in billions of euros between February and April of 2020. So this is bank lending to the investment fund sector in terms of new transactions. And what we see is that bank cash lending to investment funds declined by 50% between February and March 2020, going from about 30 billion a day to 15 billion a day by the end of March. And again, with these vertical bars, we will straight some of the interesting events that we will be looking at in our analysis. Uh, the first vertical bar is March 12th, where Bridge LTROs, a special pandemic tailored liquidity providing operations uh, to banks were announced. The middle bar is the settlement of the first such operation on March 18. That is again a PEP uh, that was announced on March 18. And the last vertical bar is the uh, uh, March 25th, when the second Bridge LTRO was settled uh, there was also a settlement of a large targeted LTRO operation, and then PEP purchases actually started on March 26. So again, some of the events we will be looking at in our analysis. So what are we going to do in this paper? We're going to analyze this March 2020 crisis to assess the impact of two interventions. First, we are going to look at the impact of central bank asset purchases under the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the PEP. And the mechanism we have in mind in terms of how this particular central bank intervention could have helped the strains in the investment fund sector is that it could have attenuated fire sale dynamic in financial markets, supported market prices of assets held by funds, and therefore improved fund performance and helped uh, attenuate fund outflows. The second central bank intervention we will be looking at is central bank liquidity provision to banks through the bridge LTROs, the special pandemic related operations that were announced on March 12th, 2020. And the channel we have in mind here is that banks may channel liquidity to funds through the money markets. And we will see whether this, uh, this is something that, uh, that took place and whether this bridge LTRO supported uh, money market activity. We're going to use several data sets in our analysis. Uh, we are going to lean in particular on detailed fund level data using the LIPA database. And we will also use confidential data on bank borrowing from the ECB matched with bank lending to funds in the repo markets. Just to give you an idea how our paper fits into the uh, different literatures out there. Uh, first, our paper is clearly related to a very vast literature on investment funds, which looked at aspects like fund fragility, liquidity management in the fund industry, fire sales, performance evaluation. Our paper provides an analysis of central bank asset purchases and liquidity provision to banks in the liquidity crisis and how these particular central bank interventions affected uh, developments in the fund sector. We also relate to the literature on the effectiveness of central bank interventions. Many papers have looked at transmission of central bank policies through banks. They looked at financial market impact or the impact of new facilities introduced by central banks. Our paper will look at the effectiveness of central bank intervention for non-banks investment funds with no central bank access. And lastly, we also relate to the literature on money market functioning or malfunctioning in crisis times, uh, whereby we will look at uh, transactions between banks and investment funds in a liquidity crisis. So with that, let me give you an overview of what we do in the first part of the paper, which focuses on the impact of central bank asset purchases on the investment fund sector. We are going to be interested in the impact of purchases on fund performance and fund flows. We are going to zoom in on the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the PEP, which is a program that was announced by the ECB on March 18th, 2020, in the evening after markets closed, and was implemented as of March 26, 2020, meaning the purchases under the PEP actually started on that date. To analyze the effects of the PEP, we are going to zoom in on a particular subset of investment funds, 
we're going to look at bond mutual funds that satisfy two criteria. First, they invest in investment grade securities. Second, they hold a non-zero share of euro area securities in their portfolio. The reason we are looking at this particular set of funds is that we want to look at a relatively homogeneous set of funds so that we can reasonably identify the effects of the PEP. That's why we look at the funds that invest in investment grade securities. The reason we are looking at the funds that have some exposure to the euro area through their portfolio holdings is that we want to look at funds that can be reasonably expected to be affected by the PEP. That's why we look at funds that have some exposure to euro area securities. Having established this particular set of bond mutual funds, we are going to do something very straightforward. We are going to compare funds with higher shares of PEP eligible assets in their portfolio ex ante. We are going to do their portfolio holdings as of January 2020. And we are going to compare these funds with funds with lower shares of PEP eligible holdings. Now, you might wonder what is the difference between these two groups of funds uh, driven by, after all, we are looking at a relatively homogeneous set of funds investing in investment grade securities. Well, the difference is related, for example, to holdings of securities issued by US issuers or securities issued by banks. So, for example, when uh, we think of US issuers, the difference between higher and lower PEP eligible fund groups is 15% of holdings. Uh, are invested in US issuers for higher PEP eligible funds, versus 40% of the holdings of lower PEP eligible funds are invested in US issuers. Now, neither US issuers nor securities issued by banks, by financials, are eligible for PEP purchases. And this is what gives us a variation across funds in terms of how much their holdings were exposed to the PEP program. So first, we're going to look at the impact of the PEP on fund performance. And this chart really tells the story. So let me tell you what's in this chart, and then I will tell you what the outcome of our regression analysis is. This chart gives you fund market value change in percent between January 2020 and June 2020, and it does so for two groups of funds. Those with higher PEP eligible holdings, that's the blue line, that the performance of the funds that have relatively more PEP eligible assets in their portfolio in January 2020. And the red dotted line is the performance of the funds with lower PEP eligible holdings. Now we normalize their performance to zero in January 2020 and we trace it over time. And what you can see is that the performance of uh, these two groups of funds is remarkably similar all the way until mid-March, including the very large drop in their performance as of the beginning of March, going until the uh, middle of March, very similar performance, parallel trend there in these two groups of funds. But as of the middle of March, in particular on as of the March 18th, when the PEP program was announced, we see that the performance between these two groups of funds decouples. The funds that have more PEP eligible holdings in their portfolio see their performance improve on announcement as of March 18th and continue trending upwards afterwards. And those funds that have fewer PEP eligible uh, securities in their portfolio still see their performance decrease uh, in mid-March and only recover later on and converge to the, uh, to the performance of more uh, PEP eligible holdings funds uh, later on by June of 2020. We put this into the difference and difference setup. And what we get is basically what you see on this graph. Specifically, what we find is after PEP announcement, this performance gap between higher and lower PEP eligible funds was 3.7% in the announcement week of the PEP. So this gap is 3.7% in the performances with those funds that have more PEP eligible holdings performing better. In the first week of PEP implementation, as of the week of March 26, we still see a statistically significant gap in performance of 2.7%. And in the second implementation week, the gap is still there, and it is 2.1% in terms of performance. Thereafter, the gap is no longer significant. So we do see that for those funds that have more PEP eligible holdings above the median, they see their performance improve immediately upon announcement of the PEP and they outperform the other group of funds 
for the subsequent weeks as well. Now, this result is interesting also because we know that there is a link between fund performance and the outflows that the fund faces. Bad performance tends to trigger more outflows. So the obvious next question is, if PEP managed to help improve the performance of funds with higher PEP eligible holdings, did it also help stem those outflows that we saw very early on in my presentation? And that's exactly what we look at next. We ask what is the PEP impact on fund net flows, so inflows minus outflows. And here is the excerpt from our regression table and our defensive setup, where again, we have the uh, PEP eligibility dummy for those funds that have more uh, PEP eligible assets. And we split the analysis in, in uh, the uh, time periods, uh, the beginning of March, the week following PEP announcement, the first implementation week of the PEP second, and the period afterwards. And what we see is that before the announcement of the PEP, when the funds face these large outflows, there is actually no difference between uh, funds with more or less PEP eligible holdings. I show you the results in two columns because one specification is risen without controls, but the results are very, very similar. Uh, no difference between uh, low and high PEP eligibility funds uh, prior to PEP announcement. But with PEP announcement, we see that funds with more PEP eligible holding, holdings have more net flows. So they have less outflows, if you will, in this period. And the effect is actually quite large. After PEP announcement, the net flows of higher PEP eligibility funds actually go up by 63% relative to the other funds. We do not find any statistical difference between high and lower PEP eligibility funds uh, uh, after the end of March. By the end of March, as we saw also on the very first graph, the runs pretty much stopped uh, in, uh, in our group of funds and the flows largely stabilized in both high and low PEP eligibility funds. So in sum, what we conclude from this part of our analysis is that PEP really helped improve the performance of funds and helped stem fund outflows. Let me go to the second part of our analysis where we look at the effects of central bank liquidity provision to banks and how it affects repo lending to investment funds. Here we are going to zoom in on the new long-term refinancing operations, so-called bridge LTROs, that were announced on March 12th, 2020. They were conducted weekly and all matured on June 24 of 2020. Why June 24? Well, that was the date uh, on which a very large targeted LTRO operation was due to settle, and these bridge operations were supposed to bridge the time until that large TLTRO operation in June. What we're going to do here in this part of the analysis, we are going to look at the relationships in the repo market between banks and investment funds. And we are going to zoom in on the relationship an investment funds had with banks prior to the COVID crisis. These bank fund relationships are actually sticky. They do not change over time. There are certainly no new relationships formed during this crisis period. And what we are going to do is we are going to look at funds that have two or more bank relationships. Why do we do that? We want to take advantage of the Quadramia methodology and control for fund specific effects so that we look at bank repo lending to funds for the same fund comparing across different banks. What kind of different banks are we going to comparing uh, uh, between? Well, we are going to split banks uh, in two ways. We're going to compare repo lending across banks with higher versus lower exposure to the pandemic induced liquidity crisis, the so-called dash for cash, uh, ex ante as of January 2020. And we are going to explore two cross-sectional splits. One is we are going to split banks on commercial paper all over. And the second split we're going to explore is we're going to split banks according to their differential holdings of excess reserves. So let me tell you a bit more about these two splits. Here is a motivation for our split on commercial paper, and this chart is giving you commercial paper issuance uh, for the banks in our sample uh, between January 2020 and June 2020. 
What it shows is that the commercial paper issuance by banks came pretty much to a standstill by mid-March of 2020. There was very, very little issuance uh, by that time, and then it recovered gradually going forward. Again, we have some vertical bars indicating some of the uh, policy interventions we will be looking at, the announcement of which will appear on March 12th. We have the settlement of the first bridge operation on March 18th and the PEP announcement. And then we have a number of events happening post March 25. So what we are going to do with this, we are going to split banks on their commercial paper rollover needs. We are going to take the amounts that, uh, that banks um, needed to roll over in the commercial paper market over the February to April period. We are going to take this as a ratio to their total assets. And this is going to give us a measure of funding liquidity needs in the bank commercial paper market. A second split of banks cross-sectionally we're going to explore is looking at the excess reserve holdings. So holdings of reserves in excess of the reserve requirements. We're going to take the amount of excess reserves held by banks as a ratio to total assets, again at Sandy in January 2020. And this is going to give us a measure of readily available liquidity, if you will, that banks had uh, when the COVID crisis hit. Now, what are we going to do with this sort of two cross-sectional splits? We are going to look at the effects of central bank liquidity provision on bank repo lending to investment funds. And we are going to test how bank repo lending to funds changed. First, we're going to look at the change in bank repo lending to funds following the announcement of the bridge on TROs compared to the week prior. And second, we are going to look at how bank repo lending to funds change following the settlement of the first bridge LTRO operation. It was also in the same week as PEP announcement happened, again, compared to the previous week. The reason we are not going past first bridge LTRO is twofold. Number one, the after the first bridge was settled, so with the second bridge out zero settlement, there were several events that happened, and I already showed them on some of the charts. There was a settlement of the targeted LTRO on March 25th. There was also a beginning of actual purchases under the PEP. So there's a multiplicity of events past March 25 that is going to be making very difficult for us to say what are exactly the effects of bridge LTRO as such. So we're going to focus on the announcement effect and we are going to focus on the settlement of the first bridge of TRO, meaning the, the moment uh, at which the money that banks actually borrowed in the first bridge arrived on their balance sheets. Now, what is the hypothesis here? We conjecture that banks that were more exposed to March 2020 liquidity crisis should be relatively more affected by central bank liquidity provision. This central bank liquidity provision in March 2020, so bridge LTROs, was aimed at alleviating bank liquidity constraints. So the conjecture is that those banks that were presumably more liquidity constrained because they were more exposed to commercial paper dry up because they had less excess reserves on, on their balance sheet uh, would be more affected by these central bank interventions. So what is our results in terms of the announcement effects of bridge LTROs? Well, I can be very fast on that because we don't find any evidence of a positive effect on bank repo lending to investment funds following the announcement of bridge LTROs on March 12, 2020. No difference between more or less exposed banks, no effect of the announcement. What about the settlement? And here is the regression table um, where, again, we are comparing banks that are more or less exposed to the March 2020 liquidity crisis. And remember, we have two splits. Uh, we have a split of banks on the commercial paper exposure, and we have a split of banks on how much excess reserves to total assets they held in January 2020. And for each of these splits, we explore two left-hand side variables. We looked at the change in transaction volumes week on week. And we also look at the change in the amounts of repos outstanding week on week. And what we see here is that indeed more exposed banks lend more. The repo transaction volumes go up by 2.44% uh, if you look at the commercial paper split, by 1.64% if you look at excess liquidity split when it comes to the change in transaction volumes. And if you consider the change in the amount of sending of bank repo lending to investment fund sector, then we see an increase of 
if you look at the commercial paper split, and uh, of 1.65% if we look at the excess reserve split. So there is some indication that the settlement of the first breach of the arrows, and again, it's also the week where PEP was announced. So at this point, it's just week on week change, March 18 week compared to the previous week. There is some association with uh, larger transaction volumes and amounts outstanding for banks that were more exposed to the March 2020 liquidity crisis. Now, there are two events at least in that week of March 18. There is a settlement of first bridge LTRO and there is PEP announcement. So you might wonder what is it that actually uh, potentially can explain these, uh, this increase in uh, repo transactions and amounts outstanding. Is it the PEP or is it the settlement of the bridge LTRO? We're going to try and get at that question by uh, looking at the regression setup where we further interact our bank exposure dummy to the liquidity crisis through commercial paper or through excess reserve holdings. We're going to interact that with a dummy of whether or not a bank actually took up liquidity in the first bridge LTRO. And so the question is, do banks that were more exposed and actually took up liquidity in the first bridge, did they lend more uh, to investment funds in the repo market following the settlement of the first bridge? And you see the results. We only find some results for uh, the changes in transaction volumes, no results for the amounts outstanding. We do find that more exposed banks that actually did take up bridge LTRO funding, increase their repo transaction volumes by 3% if we look at the commercial paper split, and by 4.19% if we look at the split based on the excess reserve holdings. So there is some evidence that actual take up um, of liquidity uh, had some effect on the transaction volumes, no effects on the amount outstanding, so possibly these uh, funds uh, obtained in the first breach of their own were used to roll over existing credit rather than on the net increase the amounts of credit outstanding. So some evidence of the association between um, bridge LTROs and bank repo lending to investment fund sector in the repo market. I am calling it an association because, uh, of course, the all banks had access to, uh, to LTROs and the decision whether or not to take up LTROs is endogenous. So this is sort of the, you know, the correlations that we show here in terms of um, how those operations and the take-ups in those operations is associated with bank repo lending to funds in the money market. Let me conclude with a few uh, sort of thoughts on the policy implications of, uh, of our work. We started off with the question of do non-banks need access to the land of last resort? Should funds be eligible central bank counterparties for our operations? Should there be a new dedicated credit facility for funds? Should fund shares be eligible for central bank purchases or should they be eligible as collateral for central bank liquidity operations? These are all the questions and ways in which funds can have some access to, uh, to central bank balance sheet uh, and have some access to the land of last resort. Now, I should say that granting funds any access to the land of last resort has costs. There are very large operational challenges and legal challenges potentially, and there are also additional risks uh, that can come in if funds do get access to the land of last resort. Now, what we try to do in this paper is something simpler than actually answering, uh, answering this host of questions of how and whether uh, funds should get access to the land of the rest through, this, through this new means, we simply asked, has the existing toolkit that was in place in March 2020, was it helpful in terms of alleviating the liquidity crisis investment fund sector faced during that time? And our answer is, well, actually, the existing toolkit was helpful. Fund performance improved fund outflows stabilized, and bank repo lending to funds was supported to some extent. So while our paper is not a normative paper that tells you what is the best way to provide liquidity to funds in a liquidity crisis or what is the most effective intervention, 
we think that it sheds some light in terms of the cost benefit analysis as we are thinking about the cost and benefits of granting funds access to the land of last resort. Our paper gives some thoughts on, uh, on this cost benefit analysis by showing that also some of the existing pools were capable of reaching the investment fund sector in the crisis, although funds did not have direct access to the land of last resort. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. I very much look forward to the discussion and your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Um, the paper will be discussed by Yiming Ma from Columbia University. Thank you so much for having me to discuss this, um, you know, very interesting paper on whether non-banks should uh, receive access to the lender of last resort. And, um, you know, let me just say again, this is a very important topic. As uh, Marie said, uh, non-banks, in particular uh, open and mutual funds that invest in fixed income securities, have rapidly grown in size. And uh, in addition to just being larger and larger, they also perform, you know, a very special and important role for the economy, which is liquidity transformation. Right. And they do that by issuing redeemable shares that investors can go and just, you know, redeem on demand on a daily basis. Um, but their assets in comparison are much more illiquid. So they invest in corporate and government bonds. So there's a mismatch between the liquidity on the asset and liquidity on the liability side. So, you know, much of what they do looks like banks and their degree of liquidity transformation has also been increasing over time, while that of banks um, have been falling. OK, and so they perform a similar function for the economy, and it's been found that they may suffer from similar risks, which is uh, the risk of having inefficient runs. Um, and the key reason, again, is assets are more illiquid. So if everyone wants to take the money out of the fund, you know, assets would have been sold but, um, at a discount at a fire sale price. And, and that is not sustainable. And hence, there's this first mover advantage to take money out and to run from the fund. Okay, and so given the importance of their function and the risks inherent in the function they perform, uh, this paper goes and asks the very important question, well, you know, if they look a lot like banks and have some of the risks that banks entail, you know, should um, they also receive uh, a lender of last resort access like we do have for banks right now? OK, and the main findings, um, as Marie summarized, uh, is that the announcement of asset purchases uh, increased the maturities of repos and more liquidity constrained banks uh, lend to funds. Uh, further, funds that have higher shares of assets eligible for central bank purchases in their portfolio before the COVID-19 crisis also endured smaller outflows and had better performance. Okay, and overall, I think um, the answer is that mutual funds were stabilized effectively without direct access to the lender of last resort. And I think the evidence presented is over very convincing. You know, I think that the execution is generally very careful, uh, combines lots of interesting data, and again, addresses a very important question. So I mostly had some big picture comments um, to think a bit more about, you know, what is the economic channel behind the results that we see and what, you know, do they mean for uh, thinking about this issue going forward? I will start by looking at uh, repos. In particular, I will, you know, Try to convince you that it's important to think about the price at which these repos extended uh, to to really address the question of whether they were able to stop runs. Um, and then, you know, I want to think a little bit about collateral and in the end, the channel through which asset purchases uh, affected and stabilized mutual funds. OK, so with that, uh, first, uh, you know, the interest rate on repos, um, I think, is important to jointly consider together with the volumes and the maturities that now the paper has been looking at and that are very important. OK, so to understand that, let's just recall for, uh, you know, the moment why uh, mutual funds have runs or have this first mover advantage in redemptions. OK, and the reason is that investor redemptions Right. To meet these redemptions, the fund needs to sell some assets. These asset sales, because they need to be done immediately and these assets are illiquid, they often incur uh, discounts. Right. So in the fire sale, for example, you know, assets are sold at a penalty rate. Now, you know, these discounts, though, they're not immediately reflected in the net asset values uh, that investors who are taking the money out obtain. Right? These net asset value values are sticky, they're sluggish to adjust, and hence, if I'm the investor and I know that this is going on, I want to take my money out first, I want to take my money out before other investors take out their money uh, so that I can get the higher net asset value that hasn't yet adjusted. 
Okay, but if everybody thinks like that, then you know we're in. Uh, uh, we have a problem because then everybody wants to front run, and everyone wants to take their money out before other investors have taken their money out. Okay, so this is similarly to the classic bank run problem where you know everyone wants to take their money out in a bad equilibrium. Okay, so you know repo right uh, could potentially have the benefit of uh, alleviating or avoiding these types of runs. OK, so, uh, you know, the ideal counterfactual scenario would be the fund, you know, when it has investor redemptions, OK, so the fund doesn't go to sell asset, it goes to raise uh, repo funding, OK? It uses that funding to pay its investors, right? Uh, and then, you know, because there's no more fire sales, there's no more discount incurred on the fund's net asset value. All right, and there's no more incentive to take the money out first because there's no discount incurred. There's no fire sale discount uh, on the net asset value in the first place. Okay, and in this sense, you know, if ex repo funding can be flexibly extended in times of stress, in times of investor redemptions, okay, then we may be able to, you know, avoid these inefficient runs from happening. Okay, and so this is the potential benefit of repo funding, but. You know, against this benefit, it's important to think about what is the potential cost of repo, right? And the cost of repo in a nominal sense is just, you know, what is the interest rate as is being charged? Okay. And suppose, okay, so suppose funds can borrow repo, but especially in times of crisis, this repo funding comes at a high or penalty interest rate. All right. And this could be very likely because, you know, it's been found that dealer bank balance sheets uh, costs are expanding in crisis times. It is also the case that repos are borrowed in the over-the-counter markets in which these dealer banks have extensive uh, bargaining power over uh, the mutual funds. Okay, and if that is the case, right, that just means that, okay, you do not need to fire sale, you don't have the fire sale discounts, but you still need to pay these very high interest rates for your funding. Okay, and if the fund net asset values are adjusting too slowly, right, uh, to reflect these penalty repo rates, Okay, then there is still that incentive to front run before the NAV has fully adjusted, or in other words, the incentives for a fund runs uh, may still persist. Okay, and so that's why, again, this is just a hypothetical scenario. It may not be like this, but again, it's good to think about, you know, what is the interest rate charged? Okay, does it really change when times are bad? Did it increase uh, more for mutual funds who need to borrow more? And importantly, how does it compare, right? How does it compare to a hypothetical interest rate that the central bank could supply, right? Because it could be that the funds right now are accessing funding at a much higher rate, at a rate that, you know, have uh, this effect on net asset values and run incentives, but that the central bank would be able to provide a rate that is more efficient in crisis times that would alleviate, uh, the, you know, the, the, the penalty rate due to the um, higher uh, repo funding rates right now. Okay, and I think that, you know, this is possible to do because the MMSR data set is very nice because it does have the transaction prices um, available. And I think that the joint analysis of volumes and rates can help us better understand, you know, whether uh, the access to let a lender of last resort could help to prevent by e runs by even more than what currently is the case with the available repo funding from just dealer banks. Okay, and just um, that was the first point, but notice that everything we discussed so far uh, would have worked with unsecured and secured uh, funding alike. Right. And, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, it's repo that is being lent to these mutual funds and uh, repo is special because there is a collateral underlying uh, that transaction. OK, and so far there's been little documentation of secured borrowing by mutual funds. Uh, I, I don't think that's because it doesn't exist, but I do think that it's because so far really there hasn't been any data. I think the only source that I could find related to this is Trinenko and Sandaram, uh, who look at really reportings, the text of the report reportings and, you know, find that, you know, uh, mutual funds have credit lines. But I think the evidence for the use of secured funding, that fact on its own is novel and interesting and could potentially be an important contribution of this paper. All right. And I think to further consolidate this contribution, uh, I think it'll be interesting to look more into what types of collateral is being used to secure the repo loan. Um, and how does this collateral vary with the fund's overall asset portfolio?
right? Is it the most liquid types of securities that they use or is it the more illiquid types? How does this uh, you know, contract change in the cross-section depending on what type of fund we're looking at, the illiquidity of their assets, and how does it vary in the time series, right? Does it change in good versus bad times? Does it vary uh, you know, at times when dealers are more constrained, et cetera, et cetera? I think understanding the role of collateral can help us understand better about you know, what is the overall economic significance of repo funding to mutual funds and also you know, how that could affect their crisis liquidity management. Okay, and lastly, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about asset purchases and the potential channels through which it has affected mutual funds, something that you know, we thought of a lot and really weren't uh, fully able to to get the answer to so you know perhaps this is possible um, in in the European setting and so this is a, a graph um, about outflows from from U.S. mutual funds and it really looks very similar to the one that Marie just showed about the U.S. Uh, the European funds which is that you know the outflows and again negative is outflows really start to be curbed uh, with the announced purchase of corporate bonds. Okay, and that was around March 23rd and April 9th. Now, there was a previous announcement of the purchase of Treasury securities through an extended version of QE, basically, that didn't really seem effective. Okay, and so both Treasuries and corporate bonds were held by mutual funds, right? In particular, investment grade mutual funds were holding Treasuries as well as investment grade uh, corporate bonds that were announced to be purchased on March 23rd. Okay, so what appeared like from a very simple and a naive conclusion here is that the purchase of some type of bonds were effective and the announced purchase of other types that are the more liquid securities were not effective. Okay, and I wonder what the channel is, uh, you know, for the funds in this paper, right? Um, because there could be two potential channels through which asset purchases can help fund, uh, you know, outflows and performance. The first one in which is you know the liquid assets that are being sold by the funds in meeting redemptions right uh, the discount on them is improved because the central bank now is announcing the purchase of these assets okay and if there's many buyers of an asset that people sell well then the sellers may not incur such a high discount and you know that uh, stems the, the potential outflows that are worried about the discounts incurred Okay, but it could also be that the purchase of e-liquid assets, uh, the ones that are not being sold, but the ones that are being held on fund balance sheets, are curving the outflows. Okay, because the uh, you know expected purchase of these e-liquid assets in the future by the central bank could convince everyone that okay, the fund is very healthy, and convince everyone to stay within the fund. Okay, and it'll be interesting to sort of look at which types of funds, what type of exposure uh, help the funds to, to benefit more from the announcement of asset purchases to shed some light on the potential transaction transmission channel of asset purchases on fund outflow and performance. Okay, and related to that, uh, you know, is if it was through these e-liquid assets, right, then is the effect just a direct expected price impact Right, of asset purchases on asset prices. Right? This would exist outside of you know, any institution. You just expect to buy a certain assets. Prices reflect that expectation and prices would go up. All right, right? Or is the effect more indirect through alleviating fund outflows, right? whereby investors look at the potential uh, announcement uh, of asset purchases in the future Right? They're assured by the fact that the fund assets they're holding is going to be bought. Right? As a result, they're less likely to run. The fund is less likely to sell assets. And that reduced asset sale at higher prices is going to help preserve fund value. Okay? It seems like the latter is a bit more of what uh, you know, the optimal uh, solution would be, because the former would basically imply a general effect and you know price impact on asset prices um, but it would be really interesting you know if uh, the data can shed any light on these potentially different uh, transmission mechanisms okay and so with that let me end just again by saying i think it's a very important topic i think the data is unparalleled and that the results are very convincing in showing that mutual funds did not require direct access to the lender of last resort to be stabilized during the COVID-19 crisis.
I think it'll be interesting to look further into the economic mechanisms at play, which includes looking at the interest rates on repos to understand whether there were penalty rates that could have still contributed to runs, even if repo volume was extended. I think looking at the collateral being used is interesting and how that could have varied over time and in the cross section. And lastly, in terms of asset purchases, you know, I think the, uh, you know, effect is very uh, interesting and it's definitely there, but the transmission mechanism is perhaps equally important, uh, especially as we think about questions such as, you know, whether mutual funds should receive direct access to the lender of last resort going forward. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Yumi. Um, so before I uh, turn to questions from the floor, Marie, would you like to take a moment to respond and maybe you could uh, in your response also reply to um, the question whether you have uh, analyzed repo rates. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. But uh, biggest thanks goes to Yiming. Thanks so much for a really fantastic discussion. It's going to be extremely helpful for us as we uh, work on the next uh, version of the paper. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I agree with everything you said. Uh, we can uh, we can and should do more on the repo analysis front. Indeed, we can and should look at uh, the prices and uh, and at the collateral. So we started looking at this, but we uh, we we have not had time to to finish the analysis. But this is def definitely on our list. Uh, I think what's very interesting is that uh, Yiming uh, and and her co-authors have shown that um, when it comes to asset sales by mutual funds. When they face a run, they liquidate the most liquid assets. Um, now, it could be that they bring some of the less liquid assets, potentially, or those most to fire sale, subject to most fire sale discount, they bring them to the repo market, including they can pledge some of the assets that are, for example, not eligible for the PEP like bank bonds and borrow against those in the repo market. And so, indeed, I think there is a wealth of information for us to explode in terms of what is the type of collateral that uh, funds pledge in the repo market? Did it change uh, with the onset of the crisis? How did the prices evolve? And indeed, in fact, the combination of volumes, prices and collateral, I think that's the triplet we need to be looking at in, in that analysis. So I fully, uh, fully, fully agree. In fact, there is sort of another channel through which PEP uh, could have held an effect, which is that it also affected the collateral value uh, of, some of, these, uh, of some of these assets. So we can also sort of interact uh, and and uh, see what the PEP uh, effect was on those collateral values in the repo market. On the PEP uh, side, uh, I, I want to say two things. One is, I think it's very, very interesting, this uh, sort of somewhat of a difference that uh, people found looking at uh, US data and Fed interventions and what we found in our paper. What's very interesting to me is that I believe uh, papers like Yiming's paper and the paper by Palato et al. document that really the biggest effect was the April 9 uh, intervention of the Fed, which really sort of targeted those fallen angels. Now, what we found actually in Europe, PEP as such had uh, uh, you know, an immediate and strong effect, and basically all runs were gone by the end of March. It, it did not sort of prolong until the beginning of April. I think this is a very, very interesting difference. And I think if there is uh, something to be explored, what is the difference between Europe and US that led to this particular difference? So that's definitely, definitely on our list. One thing that I want, another thing that I wanted to mention is that we uh, did run a robustness check uh, in our paper where we actually consider those Fed interventions and we control for Fed interventions to see whether there is any, you know, uh, sort of change in our results if we take those into account because the funds we are looking at are you know exposed to the euro area but they hold all kind of other assets as well including us assets and we and our results survive if we control for pet intervention so that's maybe something that's important to mention uh thanks so much Yiming, again please do send us uh, your slides and uh look over to you if there are more questions from the floor thanks marie and indeed thanks Yiming. great discussion so i have one question here from the floor about the repo results the question is whether um, it is possible that the most affected banks naturally decrease loan provisions and thereafter increase them back to previous levels. So whether it could be that the observed pattern is basically natural rebound and not policy induced. Um, and somewhat related to this um, on the 
PEP results um, with a different diff where you, where you focus on the announcement effects. They're very strong. Um, but then in the chart, you also show that basically both lines again converge at the end of the sample. So there seems to be also a strong reversing for the non-eligible. And uh, what what could be driving that? So what's sort of this uh, shrinking in the gap? Uh, yeah. So basically, how much is policy induced, and how much is sort of a natural rebound as bio sales go away? Yes, thanks so much. These are, these are uh, both excellent questions. Let me maybe start with the uh, PEP analysis and this gap between more and less PEP eligible funds and what can I explain the sort of shrinkage over time. Uh, now, one thing that I would like to say is that we know that uh, our um, programs uh, have spillovers to also non eligible assets. That has been documented sort of uh, with, with other programs uh, that, uh, that the ECB introduced. For example, CSPP, the corporate bond purchase program, did have spillovers also non on non eligible bonds. Um, but secondly, there was a, you know, there was sort of a sub question in this question, which is to say, how come this sort of red dotted line of less PEP eligible funds converges to the blue line? And what is interesting is that uh, if we saw this graph again, you would see that this convergence rapidly happens after April 9, which is that famous Fed intervention that Yiming has looked uh, in, in her paper and others have looked uh, for the US. And remember that these the red dotted line are funds that are much more exposed to US issued securities than the blue line. And we know that April 9 intervention where Fed basically announced that they will be supporting fallen angels had a very important impact on those funds that hold uh, this particular type of asset. So actually our evidence would square again with this April 9 importance uh, in terms of the Fed intervention, because that's actually where the two lines really converge to each other. So, so definitely spot on questions. Um, on the repo results, um, I mean, again, we, we do struggle with some multiplicity of events. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, of course, the 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 access to the uh, to the bridges is is an endogenous choice. So what we showed is sort of some association between uh, bridge uh, bridge operations and the repo lending. We do have a setup where we look at the actual take up in the LTRO. So when the question is, is it really policy intervention or is this a natural rebound? You know, the way we try to sort of uh, target that particular question is that we look at those banks that actually took up liquidity in a bridge LTRO and compare them to the other exposed banks. And we do see that they have increased uh, the amount of their lending to, to funds in the repo market. So that's sort of as, as good as we could do uh, for now in terms of sort of isolating, uh, narrowing down the effects of policy intervention there. Uh, thank you. Very clear. Um... Another question that comes up is um, on uh, on the eligibility criteria for PEP, um, and but you could say a little bit more about sort of other differences, maybe in terms of fund characteristics across the eligible and non-eligibility groups. I mean, you know, should we think of one of these groups as having more liquidity risk than another? Is this helping your results, or maybe not? Um, Yes, thank you. So we, we looked at sort of the most obvious uh, uh, fund uh, fund characteristics that literature looks at, like performance, like flows, like size, um, and ex ante, these two groups of funds are remarkably similar. And you could also see it sort of in this parallel trend uh, for the performance, for example, that I showed, but we have sort of the same for flows. But we also, again, we looked at the size uh, of assets under management and so on. These are very, so this was sort of, one goal of our analysis is to narrow down a set of funds that are quite similar ex ante. And then we could sort of really think what we are looking at in terms of this divergence in performance, that this is plausibly driven and related to this PEP eligibility. So, you know, we have some summary stats in the, in the, in the paper uh, that show that on uh, many of the key characteristics, these funds, two groups of funds are, are, are largely similar. Look, can I ask one quick, I mean, it's not a, it's sort of a thought. Yeah, um, Roberto, go ahead, hi, sure. Hi, Mary. Um, so it feels to me a little bit um, like uh, we've been talking a lot about exposed um, 
actions, you know, and situations. And I wonder if, like, how much are we thinking about ex ante implications of those exposed uh, actions and interventions? And not, not that I have any, you know, I mean, like, the, maybe you call me old fashioned, you know, there's this, always this concern, but I feel like we're not talking too much about that. I wonder if that's something you guys think about or I don't know. No, I, I think you're raising a, a very important, bigger picture uh, question, Alberto. Uh, and I, I think this question pertains to both sort of the analysis of what is the ex post effects of some of these interventions, but also the, the question as such of, you know, if we grant uh, some kind of access to the central bank balance sheet to investment funds, what kind of effects will that have on incentives to invest in liquidity, to manage the risk and so on? So I think this is you know it's it's an extremely important question for both exposed analysis of the uh, the effects of existing tools but also sort of a bigger picture question of you know if we introduce new tools or if we introduce new types of ways in which investment funds could be supporting liquidity crisis what kind of effects will it have on their extent incentives i completely agree thanks for this question so and then the last question from sebastian and maybe somewhat related, it's also a bigger picture, which you don't directly maybe address, but still it would be uh, curious to hear your views on this, which is about regulation. Um, so now in your conclusions, you talk a lot about, should we give access to the balance sheet of the central bank, but to what extent could part of this be addressed through reform of investment fund regulations, such as limiting redemptions, gatekeeping and, and the like? Yes, another very important question. So there are also, uh, I think now a, a, a number of papers that actually looked at some of the, um, the effects of some of the regulations that were introduced post financial crisis to, to uh, presumably limit liquidity risk in funds. But I think the, it's a mixed bag whether they limited the risk or actually precipitated some of the runs. Uh, but there is definitely, again, the question on the table. And again, Yiming's work speaks to that sort of this liquidity transformation done by this sector, what does it mean in terms of, uh, you know, the exposure to liquidity risk, should we regulate the liquidity holdings, should we impose some minimum liquidity requirements on this sector? I think that this is a very important question on the table, and indeed it could be something that uh, that could reduce the liquidity risk exposure. But actually going back to Alberto's point, it will also have some repercussions for how these how these funds operate and and their business model and uh, some of the financial market repercussions. So I think that it's definitely very important to to think about and indeed something that regulators are thinking about. What have we learned from this liquidity crisis and which interventions worked and which did not? Absolutely. Great. So thank you, Marie and uh, your co-authors for this interesting paper.